Hello folks, welcome back to Railways Explained. Today you will watch another video from the series in which we try to explain and present each of the railway systems around the world. This time our choice was Chinese Railways, which is, you must agree, quite challenging and complex task. Namely, our idea is the following. In today's video, we will talk about the details of China's railway history, their management and administration, and discuss some transportation facts and figures. In the next video, our focus will be on the construction of high-speed railways, although we already had a video that covered this topic. However, as Chinese high-speed network is growing faster than we managed to prepare a video, there will be enough information to upgrade the previous one. And finally, in the third video, we are planning to cover the evolution of high-speed trains in China, but also the so-called reverse engineering and other exciting stuff related to this topic. As always, let's start with the history, which, you might guess, can be a whole separate video, but let's try to do it in a slightly more concise way. Before we start, we are using the opportunity to thank all our patrons for their immense support. And we are inviting you to subscribe to Railways Explained in case you want to stay in touch with the most interesting railway stories. The construction of railway lines in China can be divided into several phases. What is common to most of them is the number of war conflicts that influenced the direction of railway development. The first phase includes imperialist China led by the Qing dynasty. The first railway line was the Wusong Shanghai Line, built in 1876 and run by the British. This line was 14.5 km in length and 762 mm in rail gauge. Interestingly, the Qing dynasty bought this railway in 1877, promptly dismantled it, and shipped all its equipment to Taiwan. China's attitude towards this line reflected its caution and resistance to foreign penetration and some degree of respect for national sovereign rights. At the same time, the Qing dynasty also realized that China must threaten itself along western lines, and the railway was no doubt one of the triggers. Therefore, in 1881, the Qing dynasty constructed the Tangshan Shuge Zhuang railway line, the first railway built by China independently. It was only 9.7 km long and used for coal transport. The Sino Japanese War in the period 1894 1895 ushered in a new era of colonial struggle in China. China's international status further deteriorated and it was forced to sign a series of treaties that gave the foreign powers plenty of rights to invest in and control railway networks. From 1895 to 1911, most newly constructed lines penetrated inland from treaty ports or foreign territories and were built directly or indirectly with foreign loans or control. So, the railways were built by the British, French, Americans, Germans, Japanese, Imperial Russia and even Belgium. By the end of the Qing dynasty in 1911, some 9,400 kilometers of railways have been constructed in mainland China. Some 41% of these had been built and 39% were indirectly controlled by foreign powers. Since most railway lines were constructed to different gauges, they were rarely connected and thus they did not form an integrated national railway network. This rapid expansion of foreign railway ownership in China aroused strong public resentment and led to calls for the domestic development of railways. It's good to know that the Qing government in 1904 allowed local provinces to organize their own railway companies that will raise funds by selling shares to citizens and levying taxes. The Beijing Zhangjiakou Railway, built from 1905 to 1909, was the first to be designed and built indigenously without any foreign assistance. The chief engineer was Zhang Tianyo, known as the father of China's railways. In 1911, when some provincial railway companies fell into bankruptcy, the Qing government sought to nationalize these locally controlled railway companies and pledged their railway concessions to foreign banks in exchange for the loans. The nationalization order provoked fierce public opposition that even led to the so-called Railway Protection Movement, 
which contributed to the Qinghai Revolution outbreak, ultimately leading to the overthrow of the Qing dynasty and the creation of the Republic of China. The period of the Republic of China from 1911 to 1949 is considered the second phase of China's railway development. This period was characterized by the strengthening of Japan's influence in China and the construction of railways with Japanese capital. Confronted with increasing Japanese pressure in the northeast, China was forced to carry out defensive railway planning in that area. But this all resulted in the Sino-Japanese War of 1937. Soon after the end of the Sino-Japanese War in 1949, the civil war broke out in which the conflicts were disastrous not only for people, but also for the railway infrastructure and rolling stock. During the Republican era from 1911 to 1948, some 13,760 kilometers of main lines and 870 kilometers of branch lines were constructed, bringing the network to a total of 21,810 kilometers. By the end of the civil war in 1949, which led to the creation of People's Republic of China, only about 11,000 kilometers were usable. The system as a whole was seriously damaged. The period from 1949 to 1978 can be described as the third phase in the history of China's railways. The year 1949 was the line of demarcation for China's railway development. The first time in the history of China, the central government truly and entirely centralized the railway system. Over 10,000 kilometers of lines were restored in just two years, so the usable network amounted to about 22,000 kilometers. Then 1978 is considered a significant turning point when the so-called opening of China began and economic reforms were implemented. By the end of 1978, all railway lines in mainland China were integrated into a single system, and all provinces and autonomous regions except Tibet had access to the system. With a route length of the railway network of some 49,000 kilometers, a primary national railway network had been formed. With the opening of China, there was also a turnaround in the railway sector, so unlike the third phase in which quantity was the focal point, in the fourth phase, which continues to this day, attention was changed to the quality of the railways. Of course, extending the network never stopped to be a priority. In this period, works are carried out to increase train speed and the volume of passenger and freight trains, but also develop new rolling stock, extend double track and electrified lines, and construct and improve remarkable high-speed railway network. Now that we are done with the history, which couldn't be done faster than this, let's try to explain the structure of Chinese railway sector. Rail reform in China played out quite differently than many of those we discussed so far. China has adhered to centralized administration and focused on state-financed network expansion programs as the first priority. The year 2013 is usually taken as a turning point in the China's rail sector reform. In pre-2013, there was the Ministry of Railways and the China Rail Company. The Ministry of Railways supervised the industry combining strategy policy and regulatory functions and administering China Rail, the network of infrastructure and transport services operated by the 18 regional rail authorities. Ministry had overall control of policy, technical standards, planning and investment, finance, and system-wide train and rolling stock dispatching. Whereas regional rail authorities, many of which are comparable to large railway companies in other countries, were responsible for daily management of railway infrastructure and delivery of rail transport services. In 2013, the National Development and Reform Commission defined policy principles for the reform of the Chinese railway industry. In line with that, the Chinese central government undertook a dramatic restructuring of the railway sector, dissolving the Ministry of Railways and separating the government functions from the operation of the railways. In March 2013, the National People's Congress passed a restructuring plan that split the tasks of the Ministry of Railways into three distinct entities. 
First, the Ministry of Transportation, responsible for overall transport sector planning and development policy. Second, the National Railways Administration, a newly established body under the MOT, responsible for setting technical standards, setting and overseeing safety standards, and monitoring the quality of transport service and construction. And third, China Railway Corporation, a newly established state-owned enterprise responsible for commercial operation of the railways. China Railway Corporation became China State Railway Group Company in 2019, but here we will stick to the name China Railway. China Railway is a state-owned enterprise with shares held by the Chinese Ministry of Finance. It focuses on railway passenger and freight transport and manages diversified business operations. It is responsible for unified dispatching and control of railway transport, but also unified allocation of transport capacity on the network, railway revenue settlement and management, public service obligations, railway construction and investment plans in conjunction with the National Development and Reform Commission. China Railway currently employs about 2 million people and the total value of assets is $1.24 trillion. Before 2013, China Rail was organized under the Ministry of Railways and thus reported to the Minister. By separating out the commercial functions and placing them under the China Railways, the operator now reports directly to the State Council, making the General Manager of China Railways a de facto Minister-level official. Therefore, at least on paper, the Minister of Transport and the General Manager of China Railways hold the same seniority. Within China Railways, conventional rail network and train operations continue to be organized under the 18 regional rail authorities. China Railways also houses seven transport enterprises, such as China Railway Container Transport and Special Cargo Services Company. However, the sector is not completely monopolistic, allowing the participation of joint venture railways, industrial networks and local railways. The central government has pursued reforms to improve the organization of the sector and has slowly begun allowing the industry to introduce new participants. Since 2008, the policy has been that all new and upgraded lines would be done on a joint venture basis. The main objective of the joint venture policy was to reduce the debt accruing to the Ministry of Railways, so these joint ventures act as a kind of financing platform to bring capital from the central government, provincial governments, other state-owned enterprises and or private companies, and borrow loans from the bank. The central government is represented by China Railway, which provides funding for investment through its subsidiaries, such as the regional rail authorities or China Railway Investment Corporation, whereas many provincial governments hold their ownership interests by establishing railway investment companies. These joint ventures are typically financed with 50% equity and 50% debt. Each joint venture partner contributes equity, with the provincial government often contributing by paying land acquisition and demolition costs. These joint ventures raises the rest of the financing by borrowing loans from the banks such as China Industrial and Commercial Bank, China State Development Bank, etc. Although the infrastructure is the property of the joint venture, most joint ventures need help to operate the rail services. So, they contract with the local regional rail authority, entirely or partially, for train operation, infrastructure maintenance and management, but also safety management and management of railway land, including maintenance and patrolling of boundaries. These joint ventures are essentially infrastructure financing and asset management companies responsible for supervising the construction use and maintenance of the asset and for that service. Finally, local railways are feeders and stubs to the state railway network, mainly for freight, such as dedicated coal transport lines. These lines are invested primarily in and owned by local governments, SOEs and or private companies. Most of the local railways are operated and managed by setting up local railway companies, while a small number are contracted out to the regional rail authority.
the development of railway infrastructure in China is a fascinating story. Their network concept is based on the railway grid, which consists of eight trunk corridors running north-south, called verticals, and eight running east-west, called horizontals, thus connecting 81 major cities. The same logic is followed by the development of the HSR network, whose plan first included four vertical and four horizontal corridors. Still, only in the last five years, that grid has been expanded to 8 plus 8 corridors. Most of the HSR lines follow the routes of existing trunk lines, but they are designed for passenger travel only, and thus provide additional capacity on the conventional network, doubling its effects. In addition, the rail network across China's diverse topography makes extensive use of bridges and tunnels. In recent years, China has really made great strides and acquired skills in bridge building and tunneling techniques. In this way, they literally created some of the most beautiful engineering marvels. We especially like the Nanjing Dashengguan Yangtze River Bridge, which carries six rail tracks two for the Beijing Shanghai High Speed Railway, two for the Shanghai Wuhan Chengdu High Speed Railway, and two for the Line S3 of the Nanjing Metro. On the picture, you can see the evolution of the network length, which in 2021 was 150,000 kilometers, the second largest in the world right after the USA. What is most amazing, this rail network only in the last 10 years grew by 60%. The total share of electrified railways is over 70%, which is also a remarkable achievement. Also on the picture, you can see the length of the HSR, which is 40,000 kilometers, where China is the absolute world first. Not only that, but China's HSR accounts for two-thirds of the world's total. In the last 10 years, the length of the HSR network has increased almost five times. As the most populous country in the world with 1.4 billion inhabitants, transport performance, as expected, is measured in really big numbers. In 2021, China transported by trains 2.6 billion people. But suppose we exclude 2021 and 2020 as a period of the pandemic and strict measures implemented by the central government. In that case, we see that in 2019 more than 3.6 billion passengers were transported, which is compared to 2011, for example, almost doubled. In this graph, you can see that in the last two years, the share of high-speed rail in passenger transportation has exceeded 70%, and it's constantly growing. In contrast to the transportation of passengers, the transportation of goods in the last six years has seen constant growth. In 2021, 4.8 billion tons of goods were transported, and an incredible 3.32 trillion ton kilometers were realized. Currently, there are more than 200 railway companies on the Chinese railway market, including the dominant China Railway with its 18 regional railway administrations. There are over 200 joint ventures and 56 railway companies, of which state railways account for the largest absolute proportion in terms of traffic. On the graphs, we try to show the changes in the structure of the passenger and goods market, which are primarily a consequence of the reform of the Chinese railway sector. The data shows that China Railway no longer has a complete monopoly of the rail transport in China. Its share decreased from 97.4 and 95.93% in 2000 to 45.28 and 76.8% in 2018. But the catch is, taking account of the market share of joint ventures controlled by China Railway, China Railway's market dominance is still very strong. In any case, this was the story of the Chinese railway system on Railways Explained. We hope you enjoyed and learned something new about the railways of the world. Before the end, we would like to thank all our patrons for their generous support. If you want to support Railways Explained too, you can do it directly on Patreon or buy some cool railway stuff in our online store. Links in the description. Don't forget to like this video, share it with your rail-loving friends, and of course subscribe to our channel and to help our production, consider becoming our patron. Until the next time, goodbye.